I'm giving an overview of what the day's about, and that'll start with why do we need these symposiums? Why do you need the standard? Um, and how does it affect you? And that'll be from the National Blood Authority's perspective. Well, we've got um, Dr. Michael Smith from the Commission who'll follow me and give the Commission's perspective. I'll then talk about the symposium aim and the program. And then perhaps the more important element is what's your appetite and what materials are either in existence now or under development to support you in implementing the program. In terms of the need, um, the National Blood Authority's perspective is we've got a very clear vision of what the need for the standard or implementing the standard is and what it would deliver for our part of the business. National Blood Authority is responsible for ensuring Australia has a safe, affordable and, and secure supply of blood and blood products. The standard was developed, or certainly we contributed and assisted the Commission in developing the standard seven on blood and blood products. We continue to work with the Commission and this, and this symposium series are co-sponsored with the Commission. Our part, the, the standard, and I think most people now have gone through accreditation and looked at it, it's changed the game in terms of blood and blood products. It, it is actually, you are getting transfusion committees and not just something that happens and it's a bit of a process. The outcomes from transfusion committees now <coughs> should or will be, uh, through accreditation, considered at the actual management level or executive level of a health service. As the, <coughs> probably the first priority for me and as the video clip indicated is the outcome we're looking for is improving appropriate use. Why do I put that number one? Well, it's because current practice is causing harm. And so we see the standard as a way of implementing patient blood management or supporting the implementation. The second one is to reduce wastage through improved inventory management. In terms of the first one, the, uh, as indicated by Professor Isbister in the video clip, we think there's a real urgency in improving appropriate use of blood and implementation of the standard. The quote on the screen is from the PBM guidelines, which are based on a systematic worldwide review, <coughs> excuse me, worldwide review of all available evidence. Those patient blood management guidelines, and um, uh, the third speaker is uh, Daryl Teague, and he'll, ac he'll actually talk to, but those, these guidelines are world, are world first and are benchmark materials. In more direct terms to the quote on the screen, and you would have heard this before, but blood transfusion is a liquid transplant. It can cause measurable harm with each exposure. The evidence suggests that current clinical practice is resulting in unnecessary transfusions and a potential for, safe, for patient harm. The second outcome of interest to us is to reduce unnecessary wastage. I personally think this is a no-brainer. Currently, wastage rates vary significantly compared to best practice. The total national cost of wastage of blood is in the order of 30 million. This is simply unacceptable not only in terms of cost, but perhaps more importantly in relation to the waste of a donor's time and effort. On current figures, approximately 70,000 or more than 70,000 donations, though, that's individuals who have given up their time and effort to donate, and we're throwing out 70,000 of those donations. Obviously, some wastage is necessary to ensure availability, but to be honest, we are a long way from what I would deem acceptable. In terms of the aim of the symposium, it's pretty simple. It's to support you to implement Standard 7 on blood and blood products. As I said, it's not going to answer all your questions but may, and may create more questions, but it will give you the basics and guidance where to go next. We, the National Blood Authority and the Commission, I know the South Australian Government, we want to support you in any way we can. So as you're sitting here listening to the presentations and today and saying that's all very well, but it's a pity they didn't do this, I'm keenly, keenly interested to hear what else you want us to do. The actual program, 
Well, we've got a range of very impressive speakers that will provide you with, in the first instance, an overview of the national safety and quality health service standards, followed by a clinical perspective of the standards and practice. This will provide you with a, a foundation for a series of structured presentations around the four criteria. And those presentations are pitched to give you practical, real tools, at least um, benchmark examples of what other health services have done to successfully I've got some competition there. Sounds like they've even got a mic. Um, to give you some practical demonstra demonstrations of how it can be done. Criteria one on governance and systems of blood and blood products prescribing use very much talks to the appropriate use objective and requires health services to have in place systems for the safe and appropriate prescribing and clinical use of blood and blood products. Criteria two, documenting patient information requires the clinical workforce to accurately record a patient's blood and blood product transfusion history. Based on the earlier symposiums, this is a real hard area for a lot of health services. Um, and I'd highlight each of these criteria, because these presentations have differed in each Melbourne, Sydney and here, if, you've got, if your area of responsibility or interest is, for example, patient information, I would encourage you to look at those presentations given in the other uh, capital cities to give you further ideas. Criteria three, managing blood and blood product safety. Very much about the waste objective and requires health service or organisations to have systems to receive, store, transport and monitor wastage of blood and blood products safely and efficiently. Criteria four, another problematic one, and if anyone's got a patient consent form where there's universal agreement, this is the solution, I'd love to meet you because um, it seems to be a very hard area to get consensus. In terms of uh, that particular criteria, obviously it's more than just a tick on a form that someone consents. It's actually that the patient has been told about the risks in relation to transfusion, the benefits and the alternatives, and what plan um, a health service has in place to manage the patient. I'm now we're going to move on to other support that's available. In the next 12 months, the National Blood Authority will be publishing a range... My apologies, I've jumped a page. The National Blood Authority, in collaboration with the Commission and other states and territories and other key stakeholders, such as the Blood Service, are developing a range of measures to support you. These fall into a three-year program, which is divided between two strategies, as shown on the screen. One, a national blood wastage reduction strategy, and the other, a national patient blood management guidelines implementation strategy, obviously reflecting the two key objectives the National Blood Authority is interested in. Generally, the supporting measures fall into four major groups. which are awareness and promotion. This symposium forms part of that, that, uh, those measures. Best practice tools, education and training, and data. Now I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what is under each of those categories and their various stages of development. As I started before, in the next 12 months, the National Blood Authority will publish a range of best practice tools on their website to support implementation of improved inventory management and patient blood management. Those who have happened upon our website would have seen that some of those tools are already in existence and available for download. These will form part of a national reference set that draw on the work being done across Australia and states and territories and by key stakeholders such as the Blood Service. What we're trying to do here at a national level is avoid replication, make life as easy as we possibly can for you. So rather than you having to sit in your hospital in isolation and produce something from um, first principles to download, badge as your own, change as you see fit, recognising that we're all individuals and we're all special. Um, and it will be based on best practice across the country. And we've got some great best practice across the country. Uh, we have the luxury of sitting at, in Canberra and we can see the best practice from Brisbane right across to Perth. So what we're trying to do is draw down on where that is and create this reference set where you can pull it down and claim it as your own. 
We also recognise our full PBM program as a significant piece of work. I'd probably put it out there, no one successfully got a full PBM program in place yet. But certainly hospitals have elements of it. So what we've done is we've tried to frame the rollout of these tools where there's an early win. So you can't, you may not be able to implement a full PBM program, but you may be able, for example, introduce a restricted use protocol in your hospital. Tension is success builds on success. Small steps at the start provides the foundation for larger steps and builds confidence. As mentioned, one of the first tools, and it was one of the first tools because we see it as a nice discrete package you could think about implementing, is restricted use policy. A number of hospitals already have successfully implemented such of a program, and it's based on those successful uh, programs. It's been subject to extensive clinical review and also public consultation. It's extensive, it's got all sorts of stuff in there. You may not need it all. So it's, you can tailor it to your particular needs. Provide you with templates you can download and modify for your hospital, including badging. And as said, it's easier to implement than a full-blown PBM program. Your satchels include some material on this tool. In the same vein, and, and exactly for the same reasons, uh, one coming fast on its tail is intraoperative cell salvage. The protocols and guidance for that are currently out for public consultation. We expect the full package to be released in October. Cell salvage is important because it's a recommended alternative to allogeneic blood transfusion. And the reality is, you know, your own blood is better than allogeneic blood or someone else's blood. You may also, if you've happened to across our website, is seeing a growing number of case studies on the website of how other hospitals have delivered improvements. What we're trying to do is facilitate a network across the country where you can draw on best practice. As part of that program, uh, there are four shown, and you'll note that one of them is from South Australia in terms of benchmark transfer arrangements or project. And today's presentation, um, so the point here is we're keen to hear your good stories. So if you've got a benchmark story, let us know. We actually want to use it to celebrate it and put you up there in lights for other health services to draw down on your experience. As indicated, the NBA will be publishing over the next 12 months a total of about 20 or so tools. First two I've mentioned. This includes everything from draft business cases and I'm aware that's a key, that's a, a, um, a key problem when you're trying to implement change. The lack of a price on blood uh, makes it difficult to get money. Through to patient consent templates. Each of them is based on existing work by a state and territory, which is then refined for you to download. We also recognise that what works for one hospital may not work for another. It's quite interesting, those benchmark, those case studies I put up there before, if you actually watch two of them, one hospital does something diametrically opposed to the other hospital, yet they both achieve outstanding results. So we're not arrogant enough to think we have the perfect solution. It's an example that just depends on the people, the power centres in the hospital, a whole range of factors. As mentioned, these tools will be put out for public consultation. There's a lot of material as part of, as we develop and put these materials out. If you have an interest or it's a particular area of specialty for you, we'd welcome your comment. We certainly, before the tools go out for public consultation, they've had some review by our special friends. And our special friends are people that, are, that um, we um, that generously give us their time to actually develop the tools. But then there's an opportunity that, it, that if you have a particular interest, you can provide comment before they're actually published. We also welcome your ideas. The change we're trying to implement is there is no silver bullet here. We are advancing on a wide front, along with governments, along with the Commission. Improving appropriate use and inventory management, I don't know any single measure that will solve the problem. So if you have something you can suggest to us, and we've had a range of suggestions 
in the first two symposiums, let us know. We're willing to take it up and work on it. The example shown there is a little thing, the price on a unit of blood. Some people would debate what effect it has. I acknowledge that, but my view is it has some effect. And so uh, if you have a good idea, let us know. On the data front, we've progressed a range of new blood net reports, and you hear a little bit more about that this afternoon. That's to support you actually, particularly in the wastage space at this, at this moment, appropriate use a little bit more problematic. So you can see where you are at the moment, see how you're progressing, and, and uh, measure your actual performance. We also expect to provide you with some benchmark data to support business cases in 2014. As typified by, the, this is a picture of the BloodNet user group. There may even be some individuals who um, are here that participate in this group. Are there, Peter? So welcome and thank you. We're very keen to engage with you at the hospital end to make sure what we deliver matches your need. And this particular group's an example of that. And we appreciate their time and contribution in developing the, um, the user requirement for the reports. Another significant area is blood safe e-learning. Um, this is in the education and training space. This is really our flagship at this stage, although we have a range of other measures in terms of engaging the colleges and societies in the front end of training. But um, blood safe e-learning is our, our flagship and they currently have a range of PBM tools under development. And I might mention here the downloads of the people participating uh, using these modules run into the hundreds of thousands now. And some hospitals are, are actually mandating their training modules as part of their internal accreditation process. So um, well done to that team because they're based here in South Australia. My presentation was tended as an introductory once over lightly of what the aim and program for the day is and some of the wider support available. My last slide is a good news story and hopefully it encourages you. The chart shows that we're already making progress and if you look at that bar there from July 2012, demand for fresh or fresh red cells in July, thank you, July compared to 12 months before, it was going up at 4%. And that's how it's been going across the years, or although it started tapering. 12 months on, there we go, this is August 2013. In the month of August 2013 compared to 12 months ago, demand for red cell had fallen real demand, not budget, by 13%. It's very impressive. That change has happened in every state and it reflects, uh, and has reflected it nationally. There's a lot of room for improvement though. I have a great debate and I even have bets. I think Stephen is here from the blood service when we discuss how the blood service is going to manage this decline. And so there are administrative discussions, but we actually have a bet, because I'm a believer we've got a lot more room for improvement. Um, certainly, it's a crystal ball, though, as to what the final base could be. As I say, we think this is the, um, only the start of a change where you could put Australia in the forefront of best practice blood management. I'd just conclude by saying implementing the standard is is a, um, a critical element of achieving those first two objectives I mentioned. The beauty of it though is it's a win-win. It saves scarce resources by reducing unnecessary mortality and morbidity. It's an easy argument to mount. Um, that concludes my overview. Are there any questions? Darryl. Um, <laughs> one of the, uh, and just a little bit of background, because unfortunately everyone forgets history when, 
when any organization does something, uh, the prices, and I know there are some disparities in terms of pricing, that was the first hit. The prices never used to be available. So our first hit, by the time you took overheads and they're loaded across different products, there are some areas that could be improved, Daryl. It would be my short answer. So I'm not saying, really, they're order of magnitude. And you're absolutely right. Some of them are skewed. Um, one of the ones that I know the uh, anaesthetists are hot on to the NBA about is the price of um, cryoprecipitate, you know, which I think is at $40. Well, that's, obviously, it's not $40. Um, so we're aware of that. We're doing a review of pricing with the blood service at the end of this year, so you'll see some adjustments. I think on the main units of blood and plasma and cryoparticipate, they're, in, they're sort of in an order of magnitude, and I know there are problems, for example, in paediatric units compared to adult units. We're aware of that. There'll be probably new pricing coming out early next year. Is that fair, Stephen? Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, going on with that, Yep. in, in this state, um, we don't have it actually costed back to, you know, hospital uh, um, uh, budgets, etc. But it is in other states, and perhaps you might say something about that. Is it going to happen in South Australia? Can we expect it? Um, is, is, is this a national policy that's going to gradually be introduced? I'll, I'll do some introductory remarks, and I've, we've got Sue Island here, so then I'm going to throw, I'm going to give a warning, I'm going to throw some heat on her for the South Australian perspective. From a national perspective, we've currently engaged the Independent Health Pricing Authority, who does the pricing for activity-based funding, and everyone's aware of that. The lack of blood in that is a problem. If you're putting a business case up for self salvage machines, the ongoing overhead for training staff, Look, I'm really sympathetic. I worked in a hospital before this job. So get your business case up. If you can't show the dollars, it's damn hard uh, because you, you sort of get deaf ears when you say it's good for the patients. Yeah, 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 OK, but where's the dollars? Um, we're acutely aware of that. Uh, at this stage, the first phase of that project is to look at technical feasibility. Everyone here would be aware data on blood use, specifically where it's used and why. Uh, some hospitals may have it now, but most don't and most of it's paper records. So that's the technical problem we've got with putting a price in the, under the national arrangements. I would say nothing's going to happen nationally for three years, perfectly frank. Uh, one, even once it's technically feasible, and we're pushing hard for it to be done to support you at a hospital level, we've still got to get over some policy issues. You know, the current legislation mandates that blood is free you know, a voluntary remunerated system, and blood is free. That's, that's government policy. To change that uh, will take a, a fair bit of effort. I'll come back. I'll invite Sue now just to comment on the South Australian perspective, and then I'll come back to say there is some good news, though, Mr Frodo. Sue. Hi, I'm Sue Island, Manager of Blood Organ and Tissue Programs in SA Health. And SA Health's been looking at the lead taken by Queensland and New South Wales and Tasmania in which the, within the public sector there's been some what they call devolution of budget, so the hospitals become, you know, they have a budget for blood and there is some accountability introduced at that level. So yes, SA Health's actually reviewing that at the moment. Um, there potentially could be a process put in, in place for public sector, but as Lee has so eloquently <laughs> shown that it's, it's complex for the private sector because of the funding and the policy arrangements and I think we'll have to wait uh, probably for some lead from the Independent Health Pricing Authority before it will impact on private hospitals. So I would say we'll be having a look at that over the next six months and uh, watch this space. Thanks Sue. The good news. The product is the minor part of a business case. We're actually doing a project at the moment that shows a size, you know, the product sits at about three, excuse me, let's say $400 per unit. Administra it's an inverse pyramid. The second tier is the administration. There's been some really good work done by Lindley Bilby in the uh, Blood Manners program at, at the cost of actually tracking 
all the overhead costs, administering, you know, the transfusion nurse costs, the time it takes to actually do a transfusion, um, all those overheads have a cost. And the top one, and this inverse pyramid is, is just, it will blow your mind, we've got some initial figures, of what is the cost of adverse effects of transfusion, the extra day in ICU. And that only has to be a day, and you're talking in the order of 10 to 20,000. 10 to 20,000 dollars. It doesn't take much to justify a business case when you've got, if you can demonstrate and point to an authoritative document that said, you know, for every transfusion, transfusion it costs this in adverse events because of extended stay in wards, extended stays in ICU. And um, that is the way we will put out material that will support your business case. So the product cost, frankly, it's a minor cost. Some of the figures we're looking at, and uh, the fresh blood costs in the sector is running at about 350 million at the moment per year. Our figures on the cost of adverse events, which result in inc prolonged stays, readmissions, extra time in ICU, run in the order of three to five billion dollars nationally. So what we're trying to do is produce some authoritative stats for you to use and say, this is, this is the saving. And uh, we think it will easily demonstrate the cost effectiveness of cell salvage of a, of a transfusion nurse. I mean, you all know that a transfusion nurse saves money just on product alone. So we're pretty confident this will be a very strong, uh, strong data to support business cases at the hospital. I'm going to have to conclude there because I'm, I'm taking up um, more time than I should have. I'd, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker. From the, um, just bear with me two seconds. And Michael, I should be able to do this without reading notes, but just in case I miss something. Uh, it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Michael Smith. He's the clinical director at the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. He's been a medical practitioner for 37 years. He's got a clinical background as a senior palliative care specialist in a tertiary hospital and a community-based practice in three states. In 2002, Dr. Smith was appointed the Director of Clinical Operations for Western Sydney, and in 2004 was subsequently appointed as a Director of Patient Safety and Clinical Quality for New South Wales Health. Um, as I said before, the Commission are our strong partners, and we very much appreciate Michael coming across to give the Commission's perspective of implementing Standard 7.